The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. In countries all over the world, the pandemic, war, and climate change have made instability harder on every level. Tonight, two cases in point. First, is Pakistan at risk of an existential crisis? Then, can Cuba survive the exodus of those fleeing economic and political hardship? It's Monday, March 20th, and that's ahead on The Agenda. Pakistan's foreign minister recently said his country is facing a perfect storm of crises amid economic and political turmoil after devastating flooding and the return of the Taliban in neighboring Afghanistan. Hundreds of thousands left the country last year and the International Monetary Fund wants substantial reforms for a $6 billion bailout the country needs to avoid defaulting on its debts. With us for a closer look, we're joined in Karachi, Pakistan, by Umber Shamsi, journalist and director of the Center for Excellence in Journalism at the Institute of Business Administration. In Waterloo, Ontario, Mariam Mufti, associate professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and co-author of Pakistan's Political Parties, Surviving Between Dictatorship and Democracy. And finally here in our studio, Sadia Malik, assistant professor of economics at York University. And we are delighted to have you Back here on our program and to our guests in Points Beyond, thank you for joining us as well. Let's just do a little fact file off the top here and bring uh, our listeners and viewers up to scratch on a bit of Pakistani history. Key historical dates, and Sheldon, I'll ask you to bring this graphic up. We start in 1947, where the Muslim state of East and West Pakistan were created out of the partition of India at the end of British rule. Less than a decade later, Pakistan becomes the world's first Islamic republic. In 1971, East Pakistan attempts to secede, leading to civil war. India intervenes in support of East Pakistan, which eventually breaks away to become Bangladesh. In 1999, Army Chief Pervez Musharraf, who actually died just a couple of months ago, incidentally, seizes power in a coup, ousting Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif. In 2007, former Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto is assassinated while on a campaign trail for the next year's parliamentary elections. And then in 2018, former international cricket star Imran Khan becomes prime minister on a pledge to end corruption and dynastic politics, but he loses power four years later. Let's continue by taking a look at a map of the region. We are talking about the world's fifth most populous country. 243 million people living in Pakistan, bordered by India to the east, Afghanistan to the west, Iran to the southwest, China to the northeast, the capital is Islamabad, and Umber is joining us from its largest city, which is Karachi. And let's start there. I'd like you, if you would, Umber, to take us back to April of last year. One minute, Imran Khan, the very charismatic and very famous prime minister of Pakistan, is in office, and then he becomes the first prime minister to be removed from office through a no-confidence vote. Sheldon, bring up a picture so we can see the two people at the center of this. There's former prime minister Khan on the left, the current Prime Minister Sharif on the right. Uh, Umber, tell us, what happened? I'm going to try and simplify this because I find that Pakistani politics is usually difficult to explain. Simply, uh, Imran Khan, who came to power and who was elected in 2018 with the support of the military establishment at that time, uh, fell afoul um, and uh, lost some of the support that he used to get just in terms of, you know, running his his uh, government. And he's admitted that in several interviews that he's uh, given um, to various TV channels and uh, digital news platforms. Um, but what happened in April 2022 was that the opposition parties, uh, you just saw Shabazz Sharif, who is the uh, prime minister and the president of the Pakistan Muslim Nawaz, uh, one of the parties that represents old Pakistan dynastic politics. His brother was prime minister. He was chief minister of Pakistan's biggest province. 
uh, Nawaz Sharif's daughter or, his, or, or the current prime minister's chief uh, if, uh, niece, actually. Maryam Nawaz is campaigning for elections in the country at the moment. So, you know, there's a dynasty at play here. Uh, the other party that was a part of uh, this movement to, to remove Imran Khan was the Pakistan People's Party. You spoke about the foreign minister. That's Bilawal Bhutto Zardari. He comes from a long line of uh, ex-prime ministers. Uh, ex-prime ministers, who I may add, also ran afoul of the military establishment and found themselves out of power. Uh, his uh, grandfather, actually, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, was hanged. So these uh, parties that represented older Pakistan dynastic politics, uh, they had been in opposition. Imran Khan uh, said that they were corrupt. Uh, several cases were opened up against them. Most of these leaders had been in and out of jail. Uh, they saw an opportunity in April. Uh, they had been planning this for a while. Uh, they saw that Imran Khan had lost his support within the military establishment, uh, the then Army Chief General Kamar Javed Bajwa, and they made a move, uh, essentially using a constitutional means for the first time to remove a prime minister, which is a vote of no confidence, uh, which is essentially the House saying, well, uh, you know, prime minister, uh, we don't want you as a leader of the House anymore. Since then, what's happened, obviously, Imran Khan refused to take this lying down um, and has, has has used various tactics and strategies. His one demand has been a uh, call for elections. Uh, now, interestingly, Imran Khan's popularity graph had fallen while he was in power. Um, but since then, it has skyrocketed massively on the basis of several uh, sort of key slogans that uh, Imran Khan has used. Corruption has been one of them. Uh, he's also used religion uh, very, um, you know, uh, whenever he's needed to. He's used anti... He's tapped into a deep vein of anti-Americanism and it's claimed, had claimed, uh, that the Americans were involved in the conspiracy to have him removed uh, as prime minister. He's also tried to bend fences and, you know, sort of, uh, get, you know, um, get back some of his... Um, um, let's say, PR within the U.S. as well. We're hiring a, a PR firm, a lobbying firm. But, you know, his tactics that he's used, these are some of the slogans, these are some of the sort of narratives that he's built since he's been removed from power. Uh, he's also massively uh, named and shamed uh, the army establishment, which has typically been behind many of many prime ministers who've lost their seats um, and has come afoul of them, just like the other prime ministers. I think the interesting thing is that some of his tactics have, uh, have uh, been, for instance, long marches. He's held two long marches. Uh, he's um, tried to dissolve two provincial assemblies, um, you know, um, as well in which he was in power. These are all in order to trigger elections. But I think more most crucially uh, is the fact that he's constantly been on the streets and there's been an ass assassination attempt against him as well. Uh, there have been several cases filed against him, uh, just as uh, the opposition leaders that I was talking about, you know, there were several cases filed against him. Imran Khan now has dozens of cases against him, uh, most of them clearly politically motivated. Uh, and okay, those let me jump in there if I can. Well. And, I'm, and I'm going to get Martin yeah. to pick up the story from there, which is to say this is yet another example of another leader in Pakistan who has been unable to fulfill a five-year term. I think if I'm right about this, I'm not sure any leader in Pakistan's history has been able to serve a full five-year term. Why not? So, as um, Amber alluded, the military establishment in Pakistan has a, a very significant role to play in, um, in politics. And Pakistan's 75-year-long history has basically been a never-ending tussle between the military establishment and the political elite. Now, the military establishment um, has tried to undermine the political elite in Pakistan using state institutions such as the judiciary and the bureaucracy uh, to... Um, uplift the authority and the power of the executive through the office of the president instead of the office of an elected prime minister. The other thing we know about the military, of course, is that has been in direct control of Pakistan's politics for almost 33 years of its existence uh, by carrying out military coups. So these two factors aside, the role of the military establishment, the third factor really is that these political elites don't really do much favor to themselves. They are corrupt. Um, uh, Amber has talked about uh, their, their dynamic Nasticism. And, and the fact that they're unwilling Democrats, uh, they have not necessarily brought about democratic governance uh, in the country either or tried to establish themselves and establish the supremacy over um, the military uh, in, in, in the country. The last thing that I would like to say about this is that there has been a constitutional amendment, uh, the Eighth Amendment, that has given the president authority to remove a sitting elected prime minister 
power um, from power. And this constitutional amendment has been in Pakistan's constitutions from 1985 to almost 2010. And during that time period, we saw five prime ministers being removed from um, office. So these three factors really explain uh, what has been going on in Pakistan and why prime ministers are so powerless, so to speak. Understood. Sadia, you teach economics, so let's focus on that. We mentioned off the top the IMF is considering a $6 billion loan to Pakistan because the economy is in such trouble right now. Yeah. What's gone wrong? Okay, so um, the economic crisis in Pakistan is quite acute. Uh, it's probably one of the worst of its kind uh, in the history uh, of uh, about 75 years of country's existence. Uh, this is manifested by an extremely large, actually alarmingly large um, external debt. Uh, so over the past, over the next five years, Pakistan owes close to $30 billion each year to various multilateral as well as bilateral international donors. $30 billion, 30 a, year. billion a year. And it has a trade deficit of about $20 billion. And the foreign exchange reserves at the moment sit at only about 3 to $5 billion, uh, down from about $17, $17 billion last year. So this is quite an alarming situation for Pakistan. Um, the currency, which is Pakistani rupee, has weakened dramatically over the past couple of months. Uh, the inflation is all time high, 30% overall and 40% food inflation. Uh, and this, this has given rise to a lot of food insecurity and rise in the poverty levels in Pakistan. Let yeah. me do a follow up with you on the flooding. We all yeah. heard about the yeah. terrible floods yeah. that took so many lives over there. How has that contributed to the economic instability? It has contributed massively. The economic uh, uh, cost of flooding, as estimated by the World Bank study, is about $15 billion, which is twice the amount that Pakistan owes to International Monetary Fund. Uh, the human uh, cost of this flooding have been massive. They have uh, affected about 33 million people, which is close to the total population in Canada. It has destroyed about 60 to 80 percent uh, of the crops in Pakistan, leading to a lot of uh, food inflation. Uh, the livelihoods of people associated with agriculture have been um, affected a lot as well. Yeah. Is this a country that is impossible to govern, given its current conditions? Uh, it is, I wouldn't say it is impossible to govern, but it is difficult to govern. Uh, and uh, I think the country has to, and as well as its economic and political managers, have to make like tough choices right now to put the country back to the path uh, of economic growth. Okay, well, I'm going to go to Mariam on that as well. Because, like, Canada is difficult to govern. Um, is Pakistan impossible to govern? Because surely it's got to be harder to govern Pakistan right now than it is Canada. I wouldn't say impossible, but I will say that it is one of the toughest countries in the world to govern uh, and uh, extremely complicated. And to me, this is completely unsurprising. To govern 243 million people who are ethnically and linguistically diverse, um, and not to mention Pakistan's geopolitical context, where um, the country, on the one hand, is trying to maintain parity with its much larger neighbor, India, um, and also being extremely important to the United States' national security interests means that uh, Pakistan Pakistan has become incredibly aid dependent. Uh, that has prevented Pakistan's uh, political leaders from uh, establishing sustainable economic institutions that, to a certain extent, speak to what Sadia is talking about, the current economic crisis um, in the country. And the last thing I would definitely say, add to this the challenges of development, add to this a burgeoning population of young people with aspirations, um, and, uh, and then a, a political elite and a military establishment that is not necessarily willing to allow democracy to flourish in the country. Yes, it is a very, very difficult country to govern, and it's facing challenges uh, in, in many different sectors. It's national security, um, threats to uh, its um, security from uh, terrorists, and then, of course, you know, internal domestic problems, as we've been talking about. Well, to the end of trying to be a good democratic country, Umber, I'll ask you to pick up the story there, because uh, a thriving journalistic sector is necessary to make that happen, and that's where you come in. And yet, we find out from Reporters Without Borders, the World Press Freedom Index, which assesses the state of journalism in 180 countries and territories around the world, and out of 180, Pakistan ranks 157, which doesn't sound too good. So I wonder how, how concerned are you about your safety, and how hard is it for you to do your job? 
Uh, thank you. Um, I think I, I, I'm, I'm concerned about my safety because I've, I've seen friends and colleagues who have been attacked, uh, who have been picked up, who have been killed. Um, one journalist who was murdered uh, last year, I worked with him for, for a few years um, at one channel, Arshad Sharif. Um, uh, he was killed in another country, in Kenya. Um, Do we know by whom? Investigation. No, we don't know by uh, we don't know yet. There has been there have been fact finding missions uh, from uh, state representatives uh, as well as independent media organizations. Uh, there have been whispers and rumors. There was a case that was opened up. We don't know. Um, similarly, there are other colleagues and friends of mine who were you know whose houses were who were a uh, house was broken into. Um, he was a former producer of mine actually, uh, and he was attacked. Another former colleague of mine was picked up for a day. We made a lot of fuss on social media. Um, I lost my job as a result of many of the attacks and and I was I lost my job doing Imran Khan's time uh, what I'm trying to say is that if it really does feel as if um, the tactics haven't changed the current government used to criticize Imran Khan and rightfully so on his democratic credentials as well as freedom of press because we saw a great slide in Pakistan's uh, press freedom index during Imran Khan's time but none of this has been corrected which points to the same problem um, if, if the problem isn't the civilian government, the problem has to be the military elite or the military establishment, uh, which is, you know, which perhaps is continuing those same tactics. Um, I think my, 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 I've been a journalist for over 20 years, um, and I think the slide I have felt noticeably, I, I still vividly remember in 2018 when we were covering the elections and we were told not to talk about rigging. I specifically remember many, um, you know, movements in the periphery, dissenting voices uh, that we wanted to include in our TV main mainstream shows, and we were specifically instructed not to do so. Um, so instructed you know, those, specifically those by whom? Well, I mean, it doesn't work as, as clearly as it does in other countries, but there would be a phone call. Uh, that we would get from um, somebody powerful who would call our, the owner of the channel or the um, you know news editor, and we were told not to do those stories. Or mm -hmm. you know more directly the, through the regulatory authority, which is called the Pakistan Electronic Media Regulatory Authority. Um, so many interviews were pulled off, and and now we see um, similarly where Imran Khan has obviously uh, been very openly naming uh, military generals, for instance, uh, and uh, uh, you know the regulatory authority has stopped a live airing of his speeches. It stopped uh, covering protests. I'm not saying that he doesn't get any coverage at all, but I just do feel that um, um, the, 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 there, there seems to be clearly uh, an attempt to at least control him. And okay. I think it's interesting because Imran Khan is seen partly as a product. Uh, you know, his there was a, the ecosystem was very similar. You know, same kind of voter bank. Uh, you know, there's also a lot of uh, support behind the scenes from uh, you know people factions within the military for Imran Khan. And now he's also, in a sense, uh, the army establishment's nemesis. Uh, and I think that that is a development that is partially new in Pakistan. Uh, many political leaders have struggled uh, and have tried to assert civilian supremacy. I would disagree with Mariam there, because there have been assertions of civilian su su supremacy in different ways. But I do think that this is different, because Imran Khan, being the kind of populist, disruptive leader that he is, has gone much further than uh, the others did, who Hello. tried to remain within the system. Okay, let me jump in and give Mariam a chance to respond to that, if we have a bit of a disagreement here, which which we love on this program. Civil disagreement is uh, <laughs> is all about democracy. So go ahead, Mariam, over to you. Right. No, I don't disagree with Umbar. There have been attempts at uh, trying to assert civilian supremacy, but at the same time, you have to agree that um, these very same civilian politicians also tend to change their political allegiances and they tend to switch mm -hmm. political parties and tend to jump in on the political party that is likely to have the support of the military in order to establish itself um, in, 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 in power. I mean, currently, if you just take Imran Khan, I mean, one of his allies in, in the Punjab government is uh, Chief Minister Parvez Alahi, who uh, has in the past been a partner of the military establishment as well, right? So um, I agree with Amber. There have been assertions. I'm not saying that all politicians have been uh, completely unwilling to establish their supremacy over the military. Um, but then at the same time, if you start digging deeper into their uh, uh, political allegiances, where these individuals came from, who groomed them, um, and very often uh, when they've partnered with the military, uh, you start to see that um, 
they might be, what item uh, unwilling Democrats. Well, while you have the floor, let me follow up on that because uh, I don't have to tell you, I suppose, uh, half the people sleepwalk through elections in Ontario and in Canada, and that doesn't <laughs> certainly seem to be the case in Pakistan where you've got provincial elections coming up and mm -hmm. uh, a general election later this year as well. What role do you think all of that is playing in the political chaos the country is facing right now? Right. So for the viewers who are listening in, I mean, uh, the similarity between Canada and Pakistan is striking, right? Pakistan is also a federal parliamentary institutional structure. We also have a first-past-the-post electoral system. Uh, however, that's where the similarities um, end. A provincial and federal elections in Pakistan have typically occurred on the same day. And so, uh, in a sense, uh, the uh, we haven't been able to separate the results of the provincial elections and the federal elections. However, what's happening this year is that provincial elections will be held in uh, Punjab and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province. Now, Punjab is a province province that has typically been the stronghold of the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz group, led by uh, our current Prime Minister Shabash Sharif right now. Um, and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province is uh, the stronghold of the uh, opposition Pakistan Tehreek and Saf, led by Imran Khan. Now, uh, both political parties, the, govern the government and the opposition political parties, are clamoring uh, to uh, win the provincial election because the provincial election, who, who wins the provincial election, is likely also to sweep the federal election. And I think the idea is that by undermining uh, each other's opponents, they could potentially tilt the electoral playing field in their favor moving forward. And this is certainly adding to the political chaos um, that is currently brewing in the country. Umber mentioned uh, cases against Imran Khan, for example. I mean, that is just one way to try and uh, uh, lessen his support base uh, in the country. Of course, that's not happening because Amber also mentioned that the political graph is uh, his popularity uh, seems to be on uh, an up tilt. Sadia, we talked a moment ago about all the economic problems the country is facing. If there were to be an economic recovery in Pakistan, what would it look like? Well, <clears throat> I think Pakistan badly needs um, fundamental economic reforms at this time. So far, the country has been following what I would call a debt-financed consumption model, whereby it relied a lot on external borrowing to pay for its imports, uh, with a very weak uh, export base and with very little foreign direct investment that the country has been able to attract over the period of time. The country has relied a lot on foreign borrowing. So now is the time to come up with a good industrialization strategy that would help the country to reduce its reliance on imports, uh, incentivize the export oriented industries and uh, attract foreign direct investment. So it is time for the economic managers of the country to make some tough choices and do some tough conversations around a number of areas. Uh, taxation system is one example. Tax, uh, the, the domestic revenue capacity of Pakistan is extremely weak, as indicated by the tax to GDP ratio of about 5% of its GDP. Does that mean people are not paying their taxes? Yeah. That's what it means. So, so that means that a lot of sectors are outside the tax net. Uh, they, um, for example, capital gains is, is not taxed in Pakistan. The, pro the real estate sector is not utilized uh, for its potential in contributing to the tax revenue. You say the country needs an industrialization policy. Yeah. What, what does Pakistan make that the rest of the world might want? I think country, uh, Pakistan makes a, a good textile products. It makes sur surgical instruments. It makes sports goods. Uh, and uh, uh, many other uh, goods that, that Pakistan need to explore and invest in. So, um, so I think a taxation system needs to be reformed. Um, and investment in human capital is extremely important because the productivity is extremely low in Pakistan. So it needs to invest in its population. Um, health and education is the key. And we, I know as an economist that uh, a country's productivity really depends on the productivity of the people that eventually determines our standard of living. Sure. So, now, we, we mentioned off the top the IMF is at the center of so yeah. much of this. And there's a, another loan that Pakistan wants from the IMF right now. But I gather it has received what, 23 loans to date yeah. and is still on the verge of default. Yeah. So what is the usefulness of all of this? Yeah, and that raises important questions about the usefulness of um, uh, the, efficient, the effectiveness of IMF as well as the countries participating 
uh, the policies of the countries participating in those programs. So just for the sake of uh, your uh, viewers' information, mm -hmm. International Monetary Fund helps uh, you know, countries in economic crisis by providing them some concessional loans, as well as technical support in the form of reform package uh, that can address their economic crisis. Now, the reform package that they propose um, has often been criticized as being too standard, like one size fits all kind of an approach that consists of some like fiscal austerity measures like cut down on government spending, raise more taxes, mm -hmm. and some market-oriented reforms like privatization, etc. Now, these are good reforms that look good on paper and theory, but in countries like Pakistan that has poor political and economic institutions, these reforms may not deliver the right kind of results because they are not implemented in their full spirit. Uh, for example, the uh, prescription of raising the tax revenues, it's often implemented by countries like Pakistan as uh, relying more on indirect taxes, with the burden of which falls on the middle income and the poor income uh, groups. Mm -hmm. Likewise, when the IMF prescribes uh, countries to sort of cut down on government spending, then in an effort to uh, introduce fiscal austerity, these countries often cut down on spending on health, education, and social security. Privatization process is also not very transparent. So, so that is one reason why uh, IMF reforms do not d deliver the results as, as anticipated. Mm -hmm. Because when the countries are in economic crisis, what they need is fundamental economic reforms, right? You need political stability so to do You need that. political stability, fundamental reforms and they they and and I don't blame IMF for that because mm -hmm. those kinds of reforms should, should originate um, from within the country than from an external financial institution Mariam I want to ask you about the diaspora here in Canada and I wonder okay. if you could tell us what kind of impact the ongoing instability in Pakistan is having on the community here in Canada Right, so Pakistan uh, contributes to um, uh, about 215,000 uh, Pakistani uh, Canadians of Pakistani origin. Um, it is the fifth largest source of permanent residents in uh, Canada. So it is a it's a substantial diaspora. Um, to what extent are they impacted by the political crisis in Pakistan? Now, this is an important question because what we've seen happen in the past is that whenever there's been instability amongst the Sikh community in India, the Sikh uh, diaspora has had something to say about it. Uh, the war, the Sri Lankan civil war, uh, also uh, resulted in the Tamils uh, protesting, the Tamil population, Tamil diaspora in Canada protesting against what was happening in Sri Lanka. We don't see that happen with the Pakistani diaspora in Canada. And I I think one of the reasons for that is that the Pakistani diaspora in Canada is not necessarily as connected politically and as inclined to participate in politics and influence foreign policy in Canada in much the same way. Now, is the diaspora being impacted? It certainly is. You see, this diaspora still continues to hold uh, business assets and other personal assets back home in uh, Pakistan. And as the Pakistan rupee is depreciating, a lot of this asset and a lot of this wealth is also starting to decline for the Pakistani diasporic citizens. So the Economic costs, yes, are being felt by the Pakistani diaspora in um, Canada. The other thing I will say is that many Pakistani diaspora families are sending money in the form of remittances back home to Pakistan to help some of their uh, family members in uh, Pakistan uh, during this economic crisis. It's a, it's a cost of living crisis now, isn't it? There's skyrocketing infl inflation in Pakistan, and Sadia would attest to the 27% unprecedented inflation rate in Pakistan. So I, I I believe that the Pakistani diaspora is getting impacted in that way as um, well. And lastly, I will say, and anecdotally, and Umber could probably speak to this a little bit more as well, is that overseas Pakistanis typically tend to support uh, the Pakistan Tehrike Insaf, uh, and that would mean support for Prime Minister X. Prime Minister Imran Khan. And so I believe if there is going to be any impact that we see on the lives of these individuals is them making financial contributions to Imran Khan's campaign, um, them participating in elections to the extent that they still are on the electoral registries in Pakistan. Quick word on that. Yeah, while um, Mariam was talking about the role of diaspora, I would say a little bit about the role of international community, particularly Canada, in helping Pakistan address its economic crisis. So I think uh, that, uh, first of all, we need support from international community to um, help support uh, continued democracy and constitutional rule in Pakistan, because that would set the incentive structure right for the policymakers to be able to make the right 
kinds of decisions, right? We need to set the incentive structures right so uh, that the policymakers are guided by uh, um, by institutions that um, encourage you know good decision making uh, and penalizes bad decision making. So I think that is important. Secondly, I think uh, Canada can contribute in sort of sitting down with the international uh, as well as by uh, by uh, uh, multilateral and um, and bilateral donors and come up with a sort of debt restructuring plan that Pakistan yeah. so badly needs at the moment. And uh, my recommendation is to link it to climate change. So given that Pakistan experienced one of the worst climate catastrophe in this century uh, and uh, the economic costs have been huge and we also know that Pakistan contributes a very mis minuscule amount of, uh, of uh, its carbon footprint mm -hmm. in terms of carbon emissions. So it is only fair that the international community offers some sort of um, maybe debt for climate swaps uh, is my 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 idea mm -hmm. where uh, you know uh, Pakistan's debt is at least partially uh, written off in exchange for sort of a commitment to put in place climate resilient uh, uh, systems. Gotcha. I've got a minute left here. Umber, I wonder if I could ask you, we talk about uh, outside influences in Pakistan. Uh, I note that Saudi Arabia and China are helping out to the tune of multiple billions of dollars and I wonder uh, what you think they expect for their money. Well, I think uh, at the moment Pakistan has constantly gone to what it calls its friends. It's fair, it's it's uh, you know deep friend loyal uh, friendship and loyalty uh, to China as well as you know long-standing friendship with Saudi Arabia to paper over uh, those much needed reforms that don't happen, uh, you, economic reforms that don't happen, and then we constantly go to the IMF and other friendly countries for more money. Actually, I think things have changed. Uh, Saudi Arabia isn't giving us money. It's not giving us an easy loan or easy rollover for debt. China, we owe a lot of money to China um, because of the BRI the, and as well as CPEC, uh, which is the um, you know Chinese infrastructure projects within Pakistan. Um, and, and they're not helping us either. So, so while they may be small sort of loans that are rolled over, Broadly, we still owe these countries money, and they're not helping us out uh, simply because Pakistan has not, uh, obviously, successive governments have not done the kind of hard work of economic reform that really needed to be done, which is why we keep going back to the IMF and asking for more money and more aid. That sums it up nicely. I want to thank you three for joining us on TVO tonight and helping us understand this part of the world much better. Much appreciated. since Fidel Castro took power more than 60 years ago have so many people fled Cuba as they did last year. Almost a quarter of a million people have left as shortages of everything from food to energy added to what were already difficult circumstances for many. With us now on the state of that country known firsthand by many a Canadian tourist, let's welcome in Miami, Florida, Sebastian Arcos, Associate Director of the Cuban Research Institute at Florida International University, and in Kingston, Ontario, Karen Dubinsky, professor of history at Queen's University and author of Cuba Beyond the Beach, Stories of Life in Havana. And we welcome both of you to TVO tonight. Let's just start by getting a little background on the record here. And I'll ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, if you would, to bring this graphic up. Uh, Canadians know Cuba very well. More than 220,000 Cubans amounting to 2% of the island's entire population, were taken into custody after crossing the U.S.-Mexico border last year. The figure is higher than during the biggest Cuban migration waves in the 80s and 90s combined. Before the pandemic, the biggest source of tourist money for the Cuban regime was, yes, Canadians. About 1.3 million Canadians would enter and leave Cuba in a typical year, more than any other nationality, including Cubans themselves. And Canadians accounted for more than half of all tourists entering Cuba at the start of 2023. Sebastian, why don't we start with this? Why are so many people leaving right now? Because Cuba is undergoing the worst crisis since 1959. And it's not just an economic crisis. It's a deep crisis of political legitimacy for the regime. People don't believe what the regime says. They don't believe there is any 
prospects of economic or political improvement in Cuba, they are desperate to leave a situation that they feel have only a downward trend and there is no chances for improvement. And a quick follow-up here. Demographically speaking, do you know who is, is leaving Cuba? Yes. There is a recent paper published in January by uh, Columbia University that argues 80% of those living are between the ages of 16 and 59, which is well within the labor force in Cuba. So that's the future, in fact, leaving. That's really exactly. problematic. Hmm. Okay. Karen, take us back almost two years, if you would. July 11, 2021, thousands of Cubans took to the streets to protest in numbers not seen in many decades. What were they protesting? Mm -hmm. They were protesting some of the same things, some of what Sebastian has already outlined. They, have pro they were protesting um, the, the, you know, economic collapse um, suffered by many countries in that part of the world um, during the pandemic. Cuba is a, a tourist economy. There were no tourists for a long time. Um, so yes, there were incredible, were and are, continue to be incredible economic challenges. I think um, what I hear from Cuban friends and colleagues is that they were also protesting what I keep, the word I keep hearing was a sense of abandonment by their, by their government, a sense that the, the government um, that's in power today was not doing enough to address those economic issues and instead was embarking on a new campaign, not a new campaign, but a renewed campaign of, of censorship, of, of, you know, basically shooting the messenger. And I think the response by the Cuban government to those protests, which was very harsh, which ended up with many people, hundreds of people in jail, many of them very young, um, caused that gap between um, people's people's sense of what the government could accomplish and what they were actually doing, that gap has just grown uh, grown wider. Sebastian, we know that many Cubans are leaving for the United States, but beyond America, what other countries are they fleeing to? Uh, there are Cubans everywhere, pretty much. Uh, but I think besides the United States, Spain is taking the largest number. Uh, there is a uh, governmental program in Spain to adopt Cubans who are descendant, who can prove descendants uh, from Spanish parents or grandparents or ancestors. And of course, uh, many Cubans can prove that. And my understanding from the news of uh, independent uh, reporters in Cuba, the Spanish embassy facilities processing people cannot keep up with the number of uh, requests they are getting of people who want to move to Spain. And in terms of people coming to America, how has the Biden administration, in your view, reacted to that development? Well, uh, I believe it took them way too long to realize that at least one part of the problem was the Biden open border policy that allowed Cuba and Nicaragua to use that to then push hundreds of thousands of Nicaraguans, Cubans, and Venezuelans through the U.S. border into the United States. I think the policy has changed, and it needs to be very clear that Cubans wanting to join their relatives in the United States must do so through a legal process that already was opened in the U.S. Embassy in Havana. Let me follow up with Karen on the issue of Nicaragua, because in November of 2021, Nicaragua announced that it had dropped visa requirements for Cuban citizens. The mm -hmm. the, I guess the, the given explanation was to promote tourism. Uh, I think someone from Nicaragua's Tourism Bureau said at the time, they are lovers of our volcanoes. They don't have any volcanoes, so they love ours. How much opportunism do you think there is on the part of uh, Nicaraguan and Cuban governments uh, related to that? That that volcano comment, um, you know, was it was it off the cuff? What is it? Was it deliberate? Um, it was. It was certainly in poor taste. Um, but Cubans, as in my experience, they're always really good at making fun of of, of the absurdities of life and and the number of volcano sightseeing memes that sprouted up in the internet um, in social media as a result of that comment. Um, it's completely it's completely cynical. Is migration desperation? Um, 
a business all over the world. All over the world, migration, desperation is is monetized. Um, I think that's obviously unfortunate in Cuba. It's no less unfortunate in, in other parts of the world. And it shouldn't also blind us, the politics of it and the, the finances of it, shouldn't blind us to the incredible human toll that um, that migration takes, that that undocumented migration takes, well, any migration. But this uh, this is these are dangerous things that people are are doing. Sebastian, you wanted to add? Yes, uh, this was uh, even more than just an opportunistic uh, chance taken by both governments. This was engineered by Havana with the help of Nicaragua. They are allies, of course. They have a common enemy, the United States. So they used this opportunity to create a bridge, an air bridge between Havana and Managua that would facilitate Cubans to just walk to the border. This is the fourth time in 60 years that the Cuban government has used engineered migration waves to force the United States to the negotiating table. And it worked. Last year, the Biden administration uh, made a number of concessions to the Cuban government, things that they wanted. They had requested more visas. They had requested more remittances. They had requested more American tourists. And unfortunately, uh, the U.S. government gave them all three in uh, May of last year. Hmm. And Sebastian, a quick follow-up. When Cubans try to flee Cuba for Nicaragua or the United States, in your view, how well treated are they when they get to that new country? You mean to the United States? Yes, or Nicaragua. Well, uh, Nicaragua is just a transit. Uh, there is a... Uh, a sort of a line of uh, mafia uh, groups that help move Cubans from one country to the next, to the next, all the way to the U.S. border, each of them charging their respective amount. Uh, the price for a Cuban person to travel from Nicaragua or, let's say, from Havana all the way to the U.S. border is somewhere between 10 and $12,000, depending on the case. Uh, once they get to the United States, they are usually admitted, uh, as Cubans have been for uh, over 50 years into the United States. And I can tell you that most of those um, 300,000, and that's the updated number that we got just in January, 334,000 enter the United States between October of 2029 and December of 2022. Most of them, they end up here in South Florida, which, by the way, is very flat, no volcanoes. But the Cubans <laughs> argue that they go to Nicaragua to see the volcanoes in Hialeah. <laughs> Hialeah, in, which is Florida. Okay, uh, understood. Let me ask you about the move by the Nicaraguan government, uh, which has apparently seen a rise in charter airlines offering exorbitantly high prices for flights out of Cuba. What's the story there? The story is essentially a collusion between two authoritarian regimes that are using uh, uh, engineer flows of migration not only to affect their common enemy, the United States, but also to make a buck. They are actually making money out of the suffering of uh, people fleeing both the uh, authoritarian regimes in Cuba and in Nicaragua. And also keep in mind the following. The Cuban regime depends almost entirely of inflows of hard currency because the Cuban economy is uh, a disaster and doesn't produce anything. One of those uh, most important inflows is that of remittances for Cuban Americans in Miami. This is another way that the Cuban regime has to absorb those dollars coming from Miami into the government financial system and away from Cubans who are uh, supposed to receive those dollars. Keep in mind, Cubans do not receive those dollars in cash. They get them on a plastic card that they can use eventually to buy the products that they want. But there is an exchange rate that 
essentially robs Cubans of about half of the value of the money their relative sends from Miami to Cuba. Karen, we're told that Cuban pro-democracy activists are appealing to Canadians not to travel mm -hmm. to Cuba. So give us some advice on that. What, what do you think we yeah, should that's do? A, that's, a, that's a really big one. Um, I know, I'm not Cuban, right? I'm not Cuban. I'm a Canadian who researches Cuba. I'm a Canadian who has for many years brought Canadian students to take courses in Cuba, in Cuban culture. Um, I think that the, um, the necessity of this migration wave, as I keep saying, is, is something that's incredibly sad and incredibly ultimately really harmful for the entire country. Is it gonna help the country to stop tourism? Who is a tourist boycott going to hurt? Well, it's gonna hurt the people, the many people who make their living from tourism, whether in, um, you know, in the large scale hotels or as private entrepreneurs, small entrepreneurs who rent out a bit of their house or they, you know, they, they rent out a bit of their house for accommodation, they rent out a bit of the house for, uh, for, um, for restaurants, etc. So I don't, I don't think a, a tourism boycott is the answer for Canada by any means. I don't think I'm, I'm looking forward to taking my students again in May under incredibly difficult conditions, not difficult for, for us as, as visitors, but, but we understand the university professors and, and artists and um, painters, all the musicians, the people with whom we have learned for so many years, they are in really, really desperate straits. And I don't see how us not going is going to, to help them. Those kind of boycotts always hurt the little people. There, and there had been this spirit of increasing entrepreneurship in Cuba during the Obama era that was snuffed out by uh, by what Trump, uh, the kinds of activities Trump embarked on. Those entrepreneurs have been appealing to various levels of U.S. government to uh, to keep the door open for increased uh, travel, increased relationships, because it's through relationships that you make change. And Canada has a, a good long history of people to people relationships with Cuba that I don't think we should see, uh, that I don't think we should stop. Sebastian, let me get your take on whether Canadians should boycott traveling in Cuba. Let's see, for Cubans, this is the way they see it. Um, the Cuban government owns a monopoly on the tourist industry in Cuba. They own a monopoly on imports and exports. They own a monopoly on all financial transactions going in and out of the island. For them, any tourist, Canadian or otherwise, visiting the island is similar to Western tourists going uh, to see, to a safari in South Africa during the apartheid years. This is the way they see it. Tourism doesn't help average Cubans. They help the Cuban government that owns the entire tourist operation. Uh, the entrepreneur class that was developed between 2011 and 2016 was squashed by the Cuban government, who felt threatened by the number of Cubans that were actually uh, contributing to the Cuban economy beyond what the government contributes. Keep in mind that over 60 years, the Cuban government, every time it's faced with a situation where he needs to choose between the welfare of the Cuban nation and absolute control, they inevitably always choose control. That is the circumstance. That's what I would support, sort of a uh, less tourist travel less foreign investment to Cuba because they are only helping to sustain the regime that is the cause of the suffering and exodus of the Cuban people. Karen, I have to ask you that directly. By taking your students down to Cuba, do you feel you are in some way supporting the regime that's been in place for more than six decades? Quite the reverse. In fact, it's not true that the state owns the entire tourist economy. Um, I know I, I can give you a million, many, many examples of uh, people who private entrepreneurs who rent out their houses. Do they pay taxes? Of course they do. So, so do so does anybody um, in the in the tourist industry in any part of the world? No, I don't think. Um, 
I want to listen to, I'm listening to Cubans. I'm not listening to uh, myself, as I said, I'm not, I'm not Cuban. I'm listening to my colleagues in Cuba with whom I've worked. I'm listening to my friends with whom I have, um, who I've come to know through my research and my work there. Is Cuba a polarized place? Of course, it's a polarized place. Are there people of who, who support the regime still? Of course, there are. Are there others who are more concerned with um, just getting, getting by, making money, getting a better future? for their kids surviving this period, whatever that's going to look like, availing themselves of the things that continue to exist in that country, such as medical benefits, education benefits. Those are the people that I'm interested in. And those are the people who we listen to. Those are the people who, who have been teaching us um, through this through this course for many years. M many of them have left as well. And so I'm certainly not being naive or dismissive of uh, the desperate situation people are in. And those with the opportunity, like many of the musicians that we work with, have left, of course. Of course they have. They have, they have the means to. It's a really bad situation. What's our individual responsibility to make it better? I think to, 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 to continue the people-to-people -people kinds of um, projects. Okay, let me put that, that to Sebastian then. Or other things. Let me put that to Sebastian then. Uh, Sebastian, are you at all concerned that if many, many Canadians who are, as we pointed out earlier, a huge chunk of tourism in Cuba, if we stop going down there, that ordinary Cubans will suffer as a result? No, I am not concerned, as I explained before. Those average Cubans that we are concerned about do not have a stake in the major, most lucrative areas of the Cuban economy. Only the state does. The state controls every hotel chain in the country, every airline, every bank, every store where decent food can be bought is controlled by the state. Mm -hmm. There is really no chance for Cubans to make a living in that country. And that explains what 3.5% of the population has left Cuba in the last year and a half. I think it's a little naive to expect that tourists traveling to a totalitarian society will be able to affect any significant change in that society. And the best example is Canadians who have been doing this for 30 years and we have not seen any significant, substantial change in the Cuban regime in those 30 years. Okay, let me follow up with you on this, Sebastian, and that is the, the impact all this will have on American politics. And, uh, you know, we have to go back, I guess, four-plus decades to remember when the Marielitos exodus from Cuba uh, it turned into a major political nightmare for then-President Jimmy Carter, uh, and it was one of the reasons he had trouble getting re-elected in 1980 and, in fact, lost that election to Ronald Reagan. Should Joe Biden be similarly concerned, in your view, about what this current exodus could do to his political prospects, not just in Florida, but across the southern United States? The administration is very concerned, and he has reasons to be concerned. Uh, we at FIU do uh, a poll among Cuban Americans every other year. We have been doing it for 30 years. We have a, a significant track of Cuban-American opinions uh, about U.S.-Cuba policy and about, of course, uh, domestic policies here in the United States. Uh, the President Obama got a significant support uh, from Cuban-Americans in uh, 14, 15, 16, uh, because they were hopeful that a change in U.S. policy will finally open up and, and uh, begin to dissolve the, key, the power of the Cuban state. That turned into a massive disappointment when the Cuban government basically retrenched it and didn't use the opportunity given by President Obama. What we have, what we see now in the poll, is that a vast majority of Cuban Americans are turning towards the Republican Party. Now, there's a tradition of support among Cuban Americans for the Republican Party. But that support has been coming down for the last 20 years, all the way to 18, 2018. Since then, we have been seeing a revival of that conservatism. And in the last election last year, 
Cuban Americans voted for the Republican candidates at a rate of about 75 percent. So, yes, they should be concerned. In our last minute here, Karen, do you want to give us your read on the political impact of all of this? It's, yeah, I'm still thinking about the tourism issue. You know, there's um, lots of Canadians go to Florida, right? Lots of Canadians go to Florida. Florida is now in the grips of a government that censors um, at the education system, that refuses to teach um, African-American history, and that is homophobic beyond belief. What I advocate, those are two issues that I think are hugely important human rights issues. What I advocate that Canadians don't go to Florida, boycott Florida, because of those issues, because of the rampant um, racism and homophobia being preached by the Florida government? No, I would say the same thing. Go and talk to people. Establish the kind of people-to-people -people ties that Canada has had with uh, Cuba and Florida in the past. And I think those are better these days. Those are better, um, better ways of pushing change than state-to-state -state policies. State-to-state -state policies hurt people. And just in our last few seconds, are you intending to take Queen students back down to Cuba when? We're going in May. You're going yeah. in May. And what's the mission of the program? Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a course called Cuban Culture and Society. Um, we are, I mean, after all of this, I can tell you, we're not avoiding the politics. It's impossible to avoid the politics. But our focus has always been on the cultural um, achievements of the place. We go to, you know, we listen to we listen to musicians, not just making music, but but playing, uh, but speaking as well. We're we're very interested in the Cuban arts world, um, and so our mission our mission is to listen to what Cubans want to tell us in terms of cultural achievements. Understood. I want to thank both of you for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your views. Sebastian Arcos from Florida International University. Karen Dubinsky from Queen's University. Buenas noches. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Monday, March 20th, 2023. Ontario needs the raw materials in the Ring of Fire for its push to be an electric vehicle powerhouse. Tomorrow, the significance of a new deal to build a road to get to them. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.